um, record. Welcome everybody to our weekly seminar series of the Department of Marine Geosciences. Um, I'm very honored to cross the pond uh, to the United States and um, we are very honored to host Professor Cecilia Mathieu from Queens College, the City University of New York, and also from Lamont Doherty Hearst Observatory from the Columbia University of New York. Uh, short uh, information about uh, Cecilia. Cecilia got her PhD in marine geology and geophysics from Columbia University. Then she continued as an assistant professor in Queen College of the City University of New York until 1998 when she later became an associate professor in 2002. Currently, she is a distinguished professor at, this, at Queens College and, um, and uh, she served as an assistant dean in the Division of Math and Natural Sciences in Queens College. Since 2003, she is an adjunct senior researcher at the Lamont Doherty Hearst Observatory of Columbia University. Her research interests include land sea interaction in the Indian Ocean, which includes tectonics, paleo-earthquake, paleoclimate, fluvial processes, developing tools for submarine earthquake geology in subduction and transform plate boundaries, global sea level changes and seismic stratigraphy along continental margins, connections and reconnections of marginal basins in response to average global sea level changes, and impact of sea level changes with storms and pollution in estuaries and coastal um, environment. So uh, again, um, uh, thank you, Cecilia, for waking up too early. I think it's very early, whether seven or eight, right? Seven, I guess. Yes. So thank you very much to wake up early. I hope that you already had the time to have a coffee. <laughs> Cecilia, today is <laughs> Cecilia today is going to talk about the sedimentation record of catastrophic Tropic earthquakes as convergence and transform plane boundaries with examples from Japan and Haiti. So, Cecilia, the podium is yours. All right, I'm going to um, share my screen then. <laughs> okay, yeah, please. here we go. All right, here we go. Okay, well, um, Thank you, Nicolas, for the uh, nice introduction. And uh, it's really good to be able to uh, join with you through Zoom. Uh, hopefully, uh, we'll be able to meet in person Zoom soon. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, as uh, Nicolas uh, mentioned, um, I have been, uh, or we have been studying earthquakes and tsunamis um, for, um, you know, about, about 20, uh, 20 years. Uh, and I, I like to acknowledge uh, uh, our collaborators. We have uh, Chris Paola, uh, Leonardo Siever, Troy Raspberry. We also um, have been working with the uh, IODP Expedition 386 to the Japan margin, and that's Strasser and Nikehara san. Uh, and also like to acknowledge the science party of the research vessel Pelican uh, and the research vessel Endeavor for our surveys in Haiti and Jamaica. And a whole um, long number names of uh, Queens College uh, undergraduate masters and PhD students that have contributed to this um, research. Um, our interest in um, earthquakes and tsunamis stemmed for the fact that um, within the past 70 years, uh, the world had witnessed catastrophic uh, events such as um, the uh, Chile earthquake, the um, 1916 magnitude 9.4, the Alaska in 1964 9.2, Kanchapka, uh, and of course the very uh, um, catastrophic Sumatra earthquakes and tsunami in 2004, uh, and then Japan in 2011. This, this map is showing the um, population density. And as you see, all these huge uh, and devastating events are occurring along our coast. Uh, and we don't really know when and where the next one will happen. So we you know, began to um, study the, these events. And one of the main reasons why um, we began studying them is uh, because Japan, and here it's uh, shown under the box, um, was uh, extremely well documented before and after the tsunami. So there's a, a lot of information and has generated, you know, uh, fields of research 
including an IODP leg just for the purpose of submarine paleoseismology. And that's basically uh, one of the problems that um, they did not expect to have this magnitude nine where it happened uh, because the one before had occurred 1500 years before. And so, you know, there's again, there's a big effort to try to uh, understand the recurrence interval and where and when these events are going to happen. And um, the Haiti um, earthquake that happened in 2010 was a magnitude seven. And then another one happened in 2021, magnitude 7.2. And uh, they were devastating. I think the casualties or loss of life was uh, more than 100,000. We will never know. Uh, it's a transform boundary, but nevertheless, um, we had a rapid response there and we were able to um, document uh, the events right after the earthquake. So um, what you see here is um, the island of Japan. Uh, and, and here uh, along the Japan Trench, the Pacific plate is subducting uh, beneath the uh, Eurasian plate at a rate of about 8.5 centimeters per year. Uh, there has been uh, numerous historical earthquakes documented. And the tsunamis, um, there's some estimation on the height, uh, for example, the Shanriku in, in 1896 and 1933 were uh, you know, pretty devastated. But when you compare that with the uh, trace height uh, of the um, Tohoku earthquake that happened in uh, 2011, uh, the waves generated uh, had an elevation above sea level of 38.3 uh, meters. So it was, it was really a huge event. And uh, furthermore, uh, what you're seeing in here is um, the uh, three-dimensional view of the Japan Trench uh, and of the ecoseismic displacement. And the ecoseismic displacement was you know, measured both on land and offshore. And offshore, it was estimated to be five times, excuse me, on land, it was estimated to be five times greater than offshore. Um, in addition to that, the overlying plate um, had been uh, displaced um, as uh, projected by several models, uh, almost up to 60 meters. So again, it was not just the tsunami, but also the displacement along the overlying plate that was huge. Um, let me see here. This is a, a differential bathymetry that was uh, produced by Fujiwara et al. in 2011. And it shows uh, the position of the overlying plate in 1999 and then in 2011. And below you see a cross section uh, of the plate displacement um, before in here with the dotted line and then after. So Fujiwara at all uh, calculated that uh, the plate had moved 50 meters horizontally and 10 meters vertically. Again, a huge displacement and a gigantic tsunami. Um, at other um, uh, uh, events related to this uh, huge tsunami uh, are slumps to the trench, and this is work by Kodaira et al. in um, 2012 of Publish, and it's showing uh, the trench before uh, the um, slump and event deposit, and then um, after um, um, the event. It was estimated to be about 30 um, square kilometers. So again, everything we see about this earthquake tsunami uh, was great. Um, so the questions that we're trying to address is first, uh, we want to characterize in space and time the uh, sedimentary deposits, we, which we're calling event deposits, that were generated by the Tohoku Oki 2011 earthquake. Another point that we want to understand is the thickness distribution of the remobilized sediment and how it relates to the slip on the rupture. Uh, then uh, we would like to understand if there are any sedimentary and geochemical signatures that help to distinguish uh, this large earthquake in the sedimentation record. And then um, we'll then compare, uh, or I'll compare the uh, uh, sediments uh, on the transpersonal plate boundary to those of the uh, Japan uh, trench margin, uh, just simply to see if we can identify patterns uh, as they relate to earthquake deposits. And then finally, um, we are uh, now working on this part. 
uh, to uh, to look um, to see if the high and low frequency earthquake ground motions uh, will deal um, different sediment remobilization mechanisms. So in other words, we are then linking uh, the sedimentary deposits to what we know about the earthquake. Uh, the, um, the area that of study was um, the Japan trend margin. And in here you see the um, Japan trench uh, and you know the four arc slope. Uh, we had several cruises to this margin. Uh, the first one was in uh, 2013 um, out of the Natushima uh, research vessel 1302 and 1319. Uh, in that survey, we um, work on the mid slope terrace here shown in this box. And then uh, in 2016, we uh, survey the trench out of the research vessel Sony, and then we just finish. Um, IODP Expedition 386 to the Japan Trench. So we have collected um, quite a bit of data beginning in uh, 2013. Um, the uh, mid slope terrace, and here you're seeing an MCS line showing the uh, um, subduction of the Pacific plate right here. And then you have the accretionary wedge. And uh, highlighted in red is the mid slope terrace. And this is a fairly flat and elongated structure that um, it's uh, parallel to the, along the strike of the Japan Trench. And it extends for uh, at least 250 kilometers. So our first um, survey took place on, on the, on the mid slope terrace. And here is where we began to look into the uh, sedimentary units that were generated by the Tohoku earthquake. Um, what you see here is a bathymetry of the mid slope terrace. And um, we um, collected a 23 piston cores, 10 meters long. And this is the epicenter of the 2011 event deposit. And we went you know, all the way from the north to south of that uh, epicentral region. Uh, we targeted, in this case, fall basins because uh, we assume that uh, the fall basins um, will have um, perhaps some activity along the fall zone and also um, some sediment accumulated in the basin. <laughs> Um, as a method, uh, we use um, short-lived radioisotopes, and then we use uh, strontium, neodymium, and uh, lead uh, for uh, traces of provenance. Um, the uh, excess lead to 10 uh, accumulates on the upper few centimeters of sediment, and it has a half-life of 22.3 years. Um, in Japan, uh, it was estimated that the flux of um, uh, lead to 10 uh, can accumulate on the sediment, uh, for example, in a core at a rate of about 44 disintegrations per minute per square centimeter per year. And therefore uh, it is considered to be in steady state in the upper um, five to eight centimeters. So remember that because we're gonna be using that uh, later on. Um, we also used cesium-137, and that was put out into the atmosphere as a result of a nuclear testing and peak in the mid-1960s. Uh, and then uh, we were able to use um, the Fukushima um, radioisotopes. Unfortunately, the um, Fukushima Daiki nuclear reactors um, had a huge accident, including explosions. And um, as a result of that, uh, they put out um, short-lived radioisotopes into the atmosphere and ocean waters. Uh, the uh, radioisotopes uh, we focus on are uh, cesium-137 and cesium-134 with a half-life of two years. When they were first put out into the atmosphere, the ratio was one. But uh, because 134 has a half-life of two years, um, it's not around too much. So um, it, we were able to capture it early on, but then um, it's, it's really gone from the sediments. Um, so what I'm going to show now is also uh, the, um, the relationship between uh, the accumulation of uh, 2011 um, event deposits to the area of maximum slip. 
And in here, we are looking at a core that is uh, recovered 260 kilometers away from uh, the area of the rupture. Um, and what caused the attention here, uh, here to the right, is the uh, profile of excess lead to 10. Uh, it, it should be an accumulation of about 44 uh, dpm on steady state, but as you can see, the enrichment is about 100 dpm and uh, is in the upper 40 centimeters as opposed to the upper five centimeters. And that the, the enrichment is forms a, a vertical line. And so this was uh, you know, really unusual to observe. When we looked at the core, the core is uh, homogeneous. This is the X-ray and it has a, you know, a layer of a cores sealed at the bottom, but both the photo and the X-ray show homogeneous um, sediment. Um, and uh, what you're looking here to the right is uh, another core. Oh, so we, we then identify this event as 2011. And what you're seeing here on the right is another core that also has the um, vertical profile of excess lead to 10, again, enrichment of 100 dpm has a huge uh, concentration of 134, about 2,000 picocuries, and it has an even larger concentration of cesium-137 of 8,000 picocuries. So um, we clearly see these are um, Fukushima isotopes, and again, this is also 2011. Uh, as we're getting closer to the area uh, of the rupture, um, the deposits become more complex, and the excess lead to 10 is uh, thicker. In this case, um, this core, you're looking at the core X-ray, the excess lead to 10 um, is in steady state, uh, at least for the upper meter and a half. And what we see is, uh, again, a complex deposit of multiple turbidites. So in this um, high um, backscatter on the core X-ray, you, you're seeing the sandy uh, part of the turbidites, and you know there's about eight or nine turbidites here. Um, the excess lead to 10 is highly enriched, is uh, more than 100 dpm. And then again, there's your uh, familiar uh, vertical profile um, that you know, is, uh, shows that excess lead to 10 is in steady state. And so um, again, this is 2011 event. And if we look at the whole um, area, um, we, uh, what we did is we estimated the budget of excess lead to 10 that was in steady state for each core. And then uh, we integrated that over an area uh, obtaining an average uh, thickness. So let us say what you see here in yellow, uh, the um, excess lead to 10 was in the upper, uh, for example, 20 to 30 centimeters. And then uh, the area in purple, the excess lead to 10 was about 70 to 80 centimeters thick. And then the area in pink, pink was uh, much lower. And that is uh, the star marks the epicenter and then the uh, lines mark the, um, the formation um, greater al along the uh, rupture zone. And so we estimated that uh, about 3,500 square kilometers uh, of the Mislope Terrace had been enriched with excess lead to 10 in steady state. And so in order to be able to have the thickness that we calculated, and this was a, you know, a geochemical as well as mathematical calculations, you needed to have an area of about 9,500 square kilometers peeled off to provide that excess lead to tend to enrich the sediments of the mid slope terrace. So I think that um, we can um, you know, safely say that um, there was a, a really surficial sediment remobilization because the excess lead to ten can be found only in the upper five to 10 centimeters over hundreds of kilometers related to the 2011 event deposit. And so um, we think that it's likely that this uh, fresh, non-consolidated material was um, entrained and um, probably formed these kind of high density flows and then had a settling plumes uh, associated with it. So um, 
what we did then is um, we wanted to know if we could characterize this um, sedimentary units and surficial sediment remobilization um, using short lived radioisotopes uh, along the trench. And then for this, uh, we, um, we uh, first work on the cores recovered by the SONE. And here you're looking at the Japan Trench um, that's uh, divided into segments. You have the Southern segment, uh, Central segment, and then the Northern segment. And, and the cores we studied were um, uh, to the south, the Sun Core um, 804, the Sun Core 812, and the Sun Core 817. And we studied these ones for radioisotopes, and then later on for stable isotopes. Uh, as part of IODP Expedition 386, uh, we sampled um, 11 basins. Uh, we're just finishing, so we don't really have uh, results on that. But um, those basins are marked here with the X. And uh, and these basins are formed as a result of the uh, subduction of the Pacific plate, uh, that when it bends, it forms this uh, Horst and Graven topography. And this Horst and Graven topography is then um, displaced by oblique subduction. And when you look at the um, when you look at the profile of the elevation along the trench, so this is elevation and this is the southern segment of the trench, the central and the northern segment. You will see that topography is, you know, is quite different. So it, it goes from 8,000 meters below sea level to about 7,700 and so on and so forth. So that the relief along the trench is irregular and uh, some of these basins are not um, connected with, with each other. They tend to be isolated from each other. So now uh, I'm gonna show you uh, the uh, results of this uh, basin to the south of the trench. And what you're looking at here is the multi-beam bathymetry showing the topography of the basin. And this is the core 804 from Sony. Uh, what's um, interesting is in this parasound image, what you see uh, on the surface is an acoustically transparent unit. And then below that, you see uh, acoustically laminated. When you look at the lithology, for example, uh, this is a core description, the upper you know, meter and a half is homogeneous. So we have been calling these deposits homogenized simply because they are um, acoustically homogeneous and also lithologically homogeneous. And then the laminated ones are mainly composed of uh, you know, fine uh, bedded turbidite, so a couple of centimeters thick. Uh, sandy uh, layers, but then you, you know they are in, interrupted by these homogeneous deposits. Um, we uh, then look at the uh, excess lead to ten to see if this was uh, part of the uh, part of the uh, uh, 2011 event. And again, uh, we see here the excess lead to ten profile of that core, and there is your familiar um, you know vertical. Uh, profile of X led to 10, the um, enrichment is slightly less than on the um, mid-slope terrace, it's about 80 dpm. Um, and uh, when we uh, look at the uh, cesium-137, um, we see it's also le much less enriched. And so we think that uh, this uh, is probably uh, related to the mid-1960s uh, uh, nuclear testing. Um, uh, and it, it, there's no traces of 134. Uh, so we're identifying this meter and a half of the upper part of the core, which is acoustically transparent as 2011. And uh, even though it's uh, acoustically transparent and homogeneous, we see multiple pulse, pulses on, on the geochemistry. So again, um, it looks homogeneous, but uh, and visually and through the core x-rays, but there's some complexity to these uh, homogenites. Um, and now um, we look at other places on the trench and we find uh, that closer to the area of maximum, um, the rupture, slip to the rupture, uh, there is also excess lead to 10. It's not as thick as in that terminal basin, but nevertheless, um, there's evidence in the trench of surficial sediment remobilization. 
So 2011 was detected also um, a surface sediment revitalization in the trench. Um, and nothing on the north. The north is uh, no, no excess lead to 10. Um, and so now we want to see if there, if there are any other um, proxies that we can use to identify um, these event deposits that are you know, uh, produced by these gigantic earthquakes uh, in the sedimentation record. And then, therefore, what we did is we uh, used strontium, neodymium, and lead isotopes uh, in what we knew uh, was 2011 um, event deposit. And this is again that core that I showed you before with the parasound image. And what's uh, you know pretty interesting about it is that uh, where you have the homogeneous um, 2011 event deposit, the um, just move this around. Uh, the um, the strontium is uh, has a narrow range, and uh, epsilon neodymium has also a narrow range. And when where you have the uh, the um, acoustically laminated, the range of both strontium and neodymium is quite broad. Uh, so there's here another characteristic that you can use in that these um, isotopes where you have these homogeneous uh, deposits associated with the 2011 uh, earthquake have a narrow range. In addition to that, uh, we're also uh, been, been able to use them as tracers uh, of uh, provenance and uh, they are, uh, the strontium is more radiogenic and neodymium is more negative. So they are, have affinity with uh, older continental crust. Um, we then tested a basin in the center and then a basin in the north. And I'm going to just show you the basin on the north. Um, as you see here, there's the acoustically transparent is a very thick, this acoustically laminated on the top and then acoustically la laminated beneath. So we're going to focus on the strontium and neodymium isotopes for that core. And again, uh, we're seeing um, the similar pattern in that where it's um, acoustically laminated, you have a wide range on the isotopes, but when it is acoustically transparent, you do have a narrow range uh, in both strontium and neodymium. And um, furthermore, in here, we are uh, seeing a different pattern in that uh, strontium is less radiogenic and neodymium is less negative, and they have more affinity with the volcanic R provenance. So we're using, uh, these isotopes for both for understanding the um, for understanding uh, event deposits generated by an earthquake and also as tools for provenance. Um, so it all appears that these uh, event deposits are acoustically transparent and isotopically homogeneous, and um, they can also be lithologically homogeneous. However, uh, after the Japan expedition, we're finding that perhaps they're not so uh, internally homogeneous. And here I'm showing you a core uh, from um, one of the kind of central basins. Uh, is this basin here that you see 91. And again, we see the same patterns of sedimentation in that um, the uh, deposit begins a sharp contact and then you have a coarse grain uh, deposit is composed of, you know, fine sand and uh, integrated with clay and then medium sand. And then you have about six meters of clearly homogeneous silty clay and then uh, a sharp contact on the top and then again bioturbation and um, lamina. Um, I like to point out that there is no bioturbation in this deposit, so it means that they are instantaneous. But however, as you reach the top, uh, there's some sparse bioturbation. And, and we think that this might be part of a settling plume. And you're beginning to see you know, a couple of like small turbidites. So as you're reaching the top of that event deposit, um, there's some uh, variability uh, uh, in more bioturbation. And, and that's likely the settling plume that we characterize with the Fukushima radioisotopes as a time and, and that might be anywhere from you know one to three months uh, deposited 
Um, and then again, the whole deposit is, you know, super uh, homogeneous. Uh, and so uh, then we move to the basin in the north, and that's the one that has the, the homogeneous isotopes as well. And again, we see the characteristic patterns of, you know, coarse grain at the base, your erosional um, feature. And then uh, what you see is patches of silt. And this silt is kind of floating in the um, sediment, it form, forming uh, kind of tear-shaped features. And then as you reach the top of the event, uh, you see some um, steeply dipping reflectors. So in this case, uh, even though the sediment points to um, kind of a surface homogeneous sedimentation, when you look at the internal structure of the core, and this is a CT X-ray scan of that core, um, you see some structure into them. And so um, we can see that these disomogenized are, most are homogeneous. A few have some chaotic uh, features in them. And, and, and even the homogeneous one, uh, the fact that they're deposited in pulses suggests that a, there's some, uh, they're not just simply settling plumes. Um, and then uh, they're acoustically and isotopically homogeneous. And so then we look into the role of sediment supply, and this is something we are just beginning to look at. And uh, Japan trench margin uh, is characterized by only, only two major canyons. Uh, one canyon is on the south, it's called Nakaminato Canyon, and it does not indent the shelf. Uh, it does have a supply of sediments from the upper four arc slope. Uh, but then to the north, we do have the Ogawara Canyon and that canyon does uh, indent the shelf and must have um, an ample supply of sediment. And this is where we are seeing, you know, the most complex homogenites. Um, most of the basins and, and the one I show you, which is 91, uh, are sourced um, either by no channels or some channels that um, are kind of discontinuous and, and are forming in the uh, accretionary wedge. So we're looking into that. We don't have a, a, a direct correlation to uh, the deposits yet. Uh, and then uh, I'd like to just move uh, to another uh, boundary. Now we're gonna be moving into the Caribbean plate um, to see if we can identify you know, similar um, sedimentation patterns as they relate to earthquakes. And the, um, in the Caribbean, the, the Caribbean plate is a microplate and it is colliding with the North American plate at a rate of about two centimeters per year. And uh, the 2010 earthquake occurred in Southern Hispaniola. And this is where our box is. And the 2022 uh, survey occurred in the Jamaica Passage. So the main plate boundary uh, is called the Enriquillo Plant and Garden Fall Zone, and it is transpressional plate boundary. The uh, Caribbean plate uh, uh, at its boundary with the North American plate um, uh, has a, a different um, uh, characteristics uh, related to tectonics in that uh, is a strike slip uh, to the north, then it becomes oblique collision. And, and we think that is, uh, you know, what responsible for the transpressional plate boundary that we are studying. Then it has oblique um, subduction and then it has frontal subduction. Uh, in um, 2011, and here we are seeing uh, to the right, we're seeing the uh, Enriquillo plant and garden, this trace here on the yellow line. And the uh, star is the epicenter of the 2010 7.0 magnitude earthquake. And the other star is the epicenter of the 2021 earthquake. It is, uh, this is a left lateral plate boundary. Uh, the, uh, Purple circles are the aftershocks of 2021. And the red uh, lines are the navigation lines of our survey um, in 2010. And the yellow dots show um, position of the cores. And these are uh, interpretations of uh, thrusts 
and uh, some of the um, um, potential uh, thrust motions related to the 2021 earthquake. Uh, uh, then um, if you go into the Jamaica Passage, which is here marked to the left, this is a, a multi-beam bathymetry uh, in three dimension that was um, collected by the French, uh, Sylvie Leroy, uh, kindly um, loaned us uh, her uh, bathymetry for our 2022 survey. Uh, and you have Haiti, uh, then you have Jamaica, and you could clearly uh, see here uh, as my arrow traces the um, Enriquillo plant and garden uh, plate boundary. Uh, these um, um, plate boundary is a bit complex because uh, initially it was um, a location for extension. Um, and you can see that in the flat basins that we survey, this is the Moran Basin, you see that that's flat, and then Navassa Basin, and then Motley Basin. However, um, this extension was in the Paleocene, Eocene, uh, around the Neogene, the system became compressional, and therefore uh, you are forming these uh, ridges, which are really uh, composed of uh, basalts, and they stand up for about maybe a kilometer or a kilometer and a half. Um, I'm, I'm gonna uh, focus on the results of the 2010 uh, event, uh, simply because we are just finished the survey and I don't have the information for that. But uh, what you're seing now is uh, Canal de Sud, 1700 meters of water depth in um, Haiti. And as a chirp showing the acoustically transparent and laminated um, sediments. Now, if we look at the cores, uh, you see again the coarse grain deposit here is uh, enriched with mafy grains. And then you have the homogeneous top, which is you know about a meter thick. Um, it's homogeneous, and this is the 2010 Haiti earthquake, turbidite or homogenite. And uh, the uh, chemistry is um, identical. It, it just does not vary within these uh, homogeneous deposits. So these characteristics are you know, very similar to what we've observed in Japan. Obviously, the scale of the deposits is totally different. We also identify a second turvidite uh, that was um, dated at uh, 25 uh, kilo a year before present, and that's even thicker. But again, it shows the same characteristics of uh, coarse grain, fine grain homogeneous and homogeneous uh, composition. So, um, and here what we think is uh, going on is uh, related more to the tectonics and the um, motion of the event in 2010, uh, because uh, this earthquake, um, and here you're looking at the Enriquillo, and this is the main event was strike slip but the aftershocks of 2010 were mainly thrusts. And what was interesting about this earthquake is that the Fred Taylor and his group uh, studied uh, micro atolls and their uplift around uh, this area that we call the Tapion Ridge. And the Tapion Ridge is um, formed along a bend of the Enriquillo plant and garden fall zone. And what Fred found is that uh, there has been a lift associated with that band and likely uh, earthquakes that have a thrust component. And that uplift has occurred every 2000 years. So he was able to document it in 2010 and then 2000 before present and then 4000 before present. So in this particular instance, uh, we are thinking that perhaps uh, the sedimentation rates in the Canal du Sud are super low. They are less than a tenth of a millimeter per year. Yet these uh, turbidites of 2010 and 2500 BP are you know, really thick. And so we think that perhaps uh, the thrust component of this earthquake uh, facilitates the uplift and the remobilization of sediment um, from behind the micro atolls uh, into the basin deep. So um, in order to you know, really understand uh, the uh, relationship between the uh, sedimentation and the earthquake, 
um, we are now beginning to look at uh, the motions uh, of the earthquake, that high and low frequency, and how they um, can potentially yield uh, different um, remobilization mechanisms. And uh, for this, uh, I'm just going to give you a little bit background on an earthquake that was uh, documented in the Nankai Trench in uh, 2013. And in here, uh, there were in many stations on the land. They are here marked by the uh, brown dots. And then there were stations on, uh, on the Order 4 arc uh, that are marked here by the yellow diamonds. And then when you look at the uh, ground motion uh, of the stations on the land, you see that uh, the amplitudes of the motion of the short period and the long period waves is here marked in the red are similar. In contrast, uh, if you look at the submarine uh, stations, you see that uh, the amplitude and the motion and the duration of the long period uh, waves is uh, much larger in the submarine environment. And so um, if we take this example and what we know about the 2011 earthquake, um, uh, and you know, we take into consideration you know, the magnitude of the earthquake, um, how shallow the rupture was, uh, what is the path of attenuation, is it closer to the rupture or distal, uh, and also uh, how is the the side responding, you know, because we are in the accretionary wedge that will tend to resonate and amplify the long period waves. So right now we are um, proposing a model that we hope to test later on with a, you know, with a physical model experiments in a tank. But then um, the idea is that if you are near these uh, large earthquake rupture zone, you will have the effects of both the high and the low frequency waves, and you will have these uh, huge uh, mass transport deposits. You can have a, you know, very turbulent uh, 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 or energetic turbidity currents, and then you're going to have the mud flows and then the settling plume. So that you you'll find evidence of evidence of everything, and you know these deposits might also be internally chaotic. Um, if you are distal uh, from the earthquake rupture, and this is uh, what we have observed in the uh, mid-slope terrace, then you might have these uh, mud flows that are surficial, and you might have the effects of the uh, settling plumes. And then if you are you know, uh, near a small earthquake, then you might have this uh, much, or a distal earthquake, you might have this you know, much smaller um, uh, Turbidites, and and that might be a lot of what we're seeing in these, uh, you know, thinly laminated turbidites that you know probably distal and um, or perhaps a smaller earthquake. So um, just to uh, summarize, I think that uh, we do have you know very uh, strong evidence that during these mega quakes, magnitude nine. Um, Surficial sediment remobilization can happen for uh, hundreds of kilometers. Uh, we've seen that happening in, in Japan and uh, also uh, in, um, in uh, Haiti. Um, we also find that the deposits thicken and they are more complex uh, you know, near the area of maximum slip to the rupture. Uh, we're also seeing that uh, these deposits uh, a very characteristic patterns of the sedimentation in you know, that coarse grain base. Uh, and then the top is homogeneous. Uh, homogeneous um, visually, homogeneous in the core x rays, homogeneous in the chemical and isotopic composition. Uh, they have no bioturbation. And then, you know, the, the settling plumes can, can last for months. You know, uh, at least uh, it's been documented for at least three months. And then, um, we are looking into the sedimentation rates because I think that's going to be pretty critical in understanding uh, what is available for transport and preservation in the record. But I think that um, you know if we begin to interpret these um, you know these uh, paleo seismic records in terms of um, the frequency of the earthquake motion, considering you know what we've learned on Tohoku and also you know the characteristics of a particular earthquake, maybe we can, uh, you know, help uh, understand uh, paleo 
deposits and um, you know advance more uh, submarine paleo seismology and uh, we do have a, a grant right now that is going to be looking at this um, uh, try to uh, uh, produce you know a magnitude nine uh, earthquake in, in a laboratory we know we know it's not going to be exact but you know, we're going to try and then uh, see, you know, what is the entrainment process? Because we think it's the positional process is important, but we also think that the entrainment process uh, needs to be better understood. And, uh, you know, that's what uh, we are going to uh, be um, uh, testing now in, um, in these uh, physical tank experiments. And uh, I guess to uh, finish, I, I like to acknowledge the funding agencies and Captain officers and crews of uh, different uh, research vessels we conduct and uh, collaborators uh, and students. So thank you. Opa, yeah, thank you very much, Cecilia. It was really impressive uh, presentation with a lot of information. So thank you very much. And it's exactly also what uh, our student needs to be exposed to marine geology and the IODP um background that um that unfortunately we are missing we have we were members but now we are we're not members and hopefully we will be back again so anyway i am opening the the um, the podium for questions from the audience for the students and and the audience in general so go ahead i don't see anybody so everybody should just pop in uh Hi, Cecilia. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your uh, splendid lecture. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure, uh, did I miss something? Or I want to ask a question about the sampling. You compared the, uh, did you compare the corpse before the earthquake event and after the earthquake event? No, not the course. It, that was just the bathymetry. A symmetry? Yeah, okay. that was just a bath differential bathymetry by Fujiwara san at all, not by me. It was, uh, I just wanted to point out, uh, to show the bathymetry, simply to point out the fact that the overlying plate move tens of meters in seconds. And okay. so the fact that this earthquake was just huge. Yeah. Okay, so um, do you think it's the, 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 the time to get the mapping of the, the symmetry uh, can influence the the because you know the it's we, we don't know what exact the time will happen the earthquake so it may be a far a long time uh, pre previous the events of the earthquake I mean the sampling of the symmetry map oh um, <clears throat> well the I think the initial sampling was in 1999 and then the second sampling was uh, 2011 right after the earthquake so if there are any possible that many small earthquake happens prior to the earthquake and change some of the sediments conditions and uh yeah sure it's possible uh, but uh, fujiwara san was not the only one that did this differential bathymetry and there were you know several other models some of them uh, showing a displacement of more than 60 meters uh, and they also had the stations uh, on on land and the stations offshore um, so i think that this is primarily worked by the japanese and i think that they are you know pretty certain of of you know their finding that's not my work. That's uh, Japanese work, based on their stations on land and the bathymetric survey. So yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. yeah. <laughs> um. Somebody else want to ask a question? Hi. Hi. Uh, Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for this talk. It was uh, very interesting. Uh, we saw in some of the calls that you have uh, events and then uh, settling between them and uh, uh, suggesting uh, multi-events. So do you think th these are created by uh, after uh, earthquakes or several triggers or just one trigger? And uh, 
system kept on collapsing and then uh, getting to a steady state? It, it could be both. I, I, I think that the, you know, the, you could have the main trigger and then the system collapsing uh, afterwards. Uh, 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 because uh, there was an after, you know, very large aftershock of magnitude seven. So I will expect for that to also produce uh, material to, you know, um, to fail. Uh, but but we don't have the resolution to be able to say exactly whether it was the main, the main event of the aftershocks. Really, um, we can tell, you know, we can tell the timing of the tsunami. Uh, you know, but that was up to a month, perhaps even more. But whether those complexities that you see are the result of aftershocks, I don't think we have the resolution to say that. In in the in the record, I I would say they are the same event. Yeah, um, it would be very hard to go back in time and say, you know, these are the aftershocks. Yeah. No, I, so, yeah, we're all wondering about that. Yeah. <laughs> have you tried in the call to date the the different events? Ah, uh, yes. So uh, one characteristic about this, and we try to date those. Yes, absolutely. And I've tried to date them. The first time I tried to date them was in the Marmara Sea in Turkey. And I had my student, because there's foraminifera there. There's no foraminifera in Japan because we're below CCD. And I had my students go centimeter by centimeter. <laughs> it was, there were no forearms. It was, um, it was kind of barren. And then we did the same thing. You know, the Haiti has tons of forums. You know, you're in the uh, warm Caribbean waters. And again, uh, it was barren. And so there's again something about it by, by which you, I don't know, you're diluting it or, or what, but why we don't have foraminifers in this event deposit, I am not sure. So um, in answer to your question, we tried uh, to date them, but we couldn't. The closest we got was with the pulses of the excess led to 10 that were telling us that this was not just like one event, but you know, several uh, turbidites with this very uh, homogeneous characteristic. And actually, if you look at the, the core uh, close, to the, close to the epicentral region on the mid slope terrace, that has multiple turbidites in it. So there is complexity to these <laughs> events. Yes, yes. We, we've not been able to date them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we tried. <Get> work. <laughs> <laughs> My first students hated me. It was like, <laughs> To pick every centimeter, I can't find anything <laughs> in two, two margins and nothing. <laughs> oh. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Cecilia. Um, somebody else has a question? Mm, well, I can ask. Uh, there was a uh, lot of uh, work done in the Cascadia margin. As much as I remember by who, oh, it was in the 90s, I think, or 80s. Um, um, probably you are accounted to that, I think. I don't remember, but I think it's the people from MBARI in the United States. Um, oh, yeah, which margin are you talking about? Cascadia, Cascadia oh, Cascadia. margin. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The people of MBARI or... Yeah, it was, uh, that's right. That's Chris Goldfinger in Oregon. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 Goldfinger, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And then later on, several others. Yeah. Are your, um, your research in Japan and, and, and Haiti uh, similar? I mean, you, do you get similar results, similar outcome to what is seen in Cascadia? I mean, the turbidites and so on, you know? Um, we're really uh, looking at different aspects of that earthquake. And that's a good question to ask because in Cascadia, they sample um, along canyons. And so uh, the turbidites in a canyon, you will expect for them to be thinner. Reason being is that we are targeting the depot centers. So we're tar targeting the terminal path of a turbidite where you know the settling plume, where the plume settles. 
And so we are seeing uh, a lot more uh, detail in these deposits. Uh, it seems to me that Cascadia had thin turbidites because you will expect that, you know, if the turbidite is going down the canyon, uh, it's primarily going to be going pretty fast. And we um, tested that in Haiti. And in Haiti, uh, we found a turbidite going down a canyon was very uh, thin, while the turbidite in the depot center was much thicker. And it was receiving sediment, not just from that pathway, but it was receiving sediment from the margins of the basin. In uh, Canal de Sud, the basin has like um, an oval shape. Uh, in Marmara Sea, the basins are nearly circular. So they are getting a lot of material from the margins, you know, that, that earthquake remobilization causes. Uh, so, you know, it, it allows for you to study that earthquake uh, better. Uh, than, I, in my view, um, if you are sampling it along a canyon. So yeah, different sampling techniques. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Itzik, do you have a question, I guess? Yes, yes, I have a question. Hi, Cecilia, thank Hi. you so much. It was a fascinating talk. And um, actually, there, there, there are two things that they, I mean, most of what you talked about was, uh, sorry. I think it froze. Oh no. What happened? What happened? I think some people froze. Uh, he froze. <laughs> okay, he's okay. back. back. <laughs> I wanted to move it uh, so that I could and it uh, disconnected the, the, the conversation. Oh, okay. Well, most of what you were talking about is, is very uh, fascinating and uh, very clear. Um, I guess uh, I, I uh, this this whole process of the settling of of, of uh, or multiple settling of, of the of the deposit. Uh, I'm wondering how how we can get to it in, in in earlier. Like you were you were going on to very very recent events, and we are dealing with a lot of much older events normally. Yeah. And, and maybe we are missing part of that uh, homogenite, which may be distributed by, uh, what would you think would be a, a, a good marker relation to give us the quantity of the material that we actually got down? Um, is there a ratio between the, the different parts of the turbidite system? Like you showed different layers, uh, is it is, is there a, a clear sorting pattern? Yeah, that's a really good question that you have, and uh, it's very uh, complex. Uh, we grain size show they tend to find upwards, uh, but in some instances they don't, and uh, I would go for the finding upwards part. And then I will go for the homogeneous chemistry. And that's how we found them. The chemistry was consistently homogeneous in the Marmara, where we did you know, a whole bunch of cores, homogeneous in Haiti, uh, in both the recent and the old turbidite, and then now homogeneous in Japan. And we did uh, both elements and uh, we did uh, isotopes, the strontium, neodymium, and lead. And the three isotopes, strontium, neodymium, and let's show this homogeneous pattern, uh, whether, you know, that is surface sediment remobilization, uh, which is, you know, what, what we found to be happening in Japan, would be good to test in other settings and see, you know, if try chemistry and isotopes and see if they are similar and then try grain size and see, you know, if it finds upwards or, uh, or if, if, if it's chaotic within the homogeneous component. Yeah. So I think that's what I would do. Um, and try the thickest one, <laughs> the one that's, you know, um, looks homogeneous, but it's the thickest one. 
Um, and if you obviously can track it along uh, a reflector, obviously that would be also really good to do um, you know, through distance and then, and then try to identify where is more complex and where is least complex, something like that. Um, yeah, I wish I had a better answer. <laughs> it's a complicated topic, yes. Yes, no, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what we're going to do. Us, uh, uh, you know, it, it gives us a perspective yeah. that we don't normally have. Uh, luckily, we don't have uh, many of those very, very, very recent ones. Yeah. And, uh, um, let's do it this way. But, uh, but yeah, it's a, very, it's a very interesting thing. The other thing that uh, I really would like to dig a little bit more into, thank you, is, is the... Is the lack of foraminifera like the source okay. the source sediment yeah. should have foraminifera in it yeah should have seen the original is it grind by the process is it is there is there an, an elevated is, is the carbonate content the same i wish it i don't have the answer for that at all i wish i had because uh, trust me uh, <laughs> we tried <laughs> and the uh, why and it was, uh, and we found it in Turkey. And I go, okay, well, who knows? Maybe there are not there aren't too many forums in Marmara Sea. But then when we went into uh, into Haiti, which is like loaded with forums, and I, I couldn't explain. And obviously, I used it in a positive way, and saying, okay, well, I don't think this is a storm because people say, oh well, how do you know it's not a storm? I said, if it was a storm, it will have some other components. Uh, coming from the land, like organic matter, or even you know, foraminifera that are benthic and displaced, but we weren't finding them, and so yeah, so that uh, um, I don't have an answer. Sorry. <laughs> In terms of simple mineralogical composition, mm -hmm. like yeah. the amount of carbonate, the amount of the different elements, mm -hmm. is it the same composition as the sediment that you find nearby, or is it different in composition? Are we missing the carbonate? Is the carbonate out? Yeah, so the calcium carbonate was out. It is out. It yeah. is actually going away. Yeah, it wasn't there, it wasn't there in, in, in any extent, uh, you know, uh, of uh, wow. the composition. So it was mainly like silica and uh, aluminum silica. Uh, in the case, with, it then also matters as to, uh, where you are, because in uh, Haiti, uh, we had a lot of uh, mafix, and so we had iron, we had titanium, we had copper in those turbidites. Uh, well, in Marmara, it was much more homogeneous, uh, you know, silicon aluminum uh, composition. And then in Japan, uh, we did the isotope, so uh, that we just, uh, didn't do the, the elemental chemistry, we did the isotopes. We are doing the elemental chemistry now, but not before. So, yeah. But I will look for uh, homogeneity. Homogene is it yeah. published? Is this a compositional thing? Is this published? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can uh, look into uh, in Mercurial uh, 2011 and then Mercurial 2020. And then you'll find, uh, you'll find all the chemistry of this, uh, oh, and then this Mercurial 2014 in Haiti. So, I mean, excuse me, Marmara. So we have that, yeah. So, I mean, we find it in several settings, um, but yeah, I agree with you. Um, if you find the answer, let me know. <laughs> was why, why I don't have forums when I want, when I need them. <laughs> yeah, no, but that's, you know, really good questions. Uh, but my advice is, uh, I would do obviously grain size and I would do chemistry and yeah, see if I have sure. this homogeneous characteristic in your deposit and then track them if you can, you know, if you have an outcrop and you can track them through the outcrop, um, that would be um, good. <laughs> More questions than answers, I know. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, do we have more questions? <laughs> Because otherwise we are deep into the second hour, so. Okay. <laughs> well, I don't see more questions. So Cecilia, again, uh, I thank you very much. We thank you very much okay. to be here yeah. with us. And we sincerely hope that next time we will uh, drink a, uh, a mate <laughs> <laughs> rather here in Haifa or in New York. You and Panara. <laughs>
Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Bye. Okay. Bye, everybody. See you next week. Bye, bye.